Thank you to these companies and organizations that make the Before I Die New Mexico Festival possible. A good goodbye, Gail Rubin, puts the fun in funeral planning. Compassion and choices, improving care, expanding options, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. Daniel's Family Funerals and Cremations, Fairview Memorial Park, Gabaldon Mortuary, Sandia Memory Gardens, and Vista Verde Memorial Park, all in the Albuquerque area. Estate Pros, offering professional dispersal of personal possessions due to a move, illness, or death. The Final Exit Network, educating about and defending the right to choose at end of life. French Funerals and Cremations and Sunset Memorial Park in Albuquerque. Gathering Us, providing in-person and virtual memorial services and online memorial pages. Keeper, providing hybrid and virtual memorial services and keeping memories alive with online tributes to preserve, celebrate, and share life legacies. Morris Hall, estate planning attorneys in New Mexico and Arizona. Remembering a Life, your guide to honoring a life well-lived from planning a tribute to mourning a loved one. And Retirement Extender, investment management services with a personalized strategy recommendation based on your needs and objectives. Hello, yay! Welcome all of you here in this room and all of you out there in Zoom land and those of you who may be watching this as a YouTube video later. Very excited to be combining the in-person experience with the online virtual experience. Last year, our fourth annual Before I Die Festival was totally online. So we continue to evolve to continue these conversations and educational and entertaining sessions that help us start conversations about planning ahead for end of life issues. Because despite great advances in medical care, humans do still have a 100% mortality rate. So right off the bat this morning, we are going to start here in this room with Josh McManigal, who is the Director of Operations for Park Lawn Corporation, which are the funeral homes and cemeteries that we recognize. And through the magic of gathering us and Zoom, we are hooking up with LaShonda Fitch with the Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln is interred, and Justin Blanford, who is the Superintendent of Historic Sites for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and he knows a lot about Abraham Lincoln and his tomb, and we'll be hearing from them later. But first, we're going to hear from Josh McManigal about Abraham Lincoln and embalming, and of course, the Civil War. Please welcome Josh. Thank you, Gail. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us here um, and joining us online. Uh, and thank you for making the time to be with us today. Um, like Gail said, my name is Joshua McManigal, and for those of you that were with me on the tour a little bit ago, I apologize for some of the stuff that I might uh, repeat, but sorry. <laughs> Which reminds me, there, you know, the, there is a difference between I'm sorry and I apologize, right? Try saying I apologize at a funeral. I was told not to start with a joke, but I did anyway, so. <laughs> so like Gail said, I am, uh, my name is Joshua, and I'm with uh, Park Lawn Corporation. I'm the director of operations, and I oversee nine funeral homes, three cemeteries, and a crematory here in the Albuquerque Rio Rancho area. I have been in this line of work for about 16 years now. Um, I started my career in Houston, Texas. Uh, going to mortuary school there, a graduate of Commonwealth Institute of Funeral Service, 
Um, I am licensed as a funeral director and embalmer in the state of Texas. I am licensed as a funeral director and embalmer uh, in the state of New Mexico as well. Uh, I hold an FSP license here in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is one of the few states that have different types of licensure. One is an FSP, which is a funeral service practitioner, which means I went to school, I went and took the national boards tests, I've done apprenticeships and, and things like that. And then there's also an FSI, which is a funeral service intern who can come in and instead of going to school, they can basically do on the job training, um, kind of like a, a technical uh, uh, support job, things like that, um, which we are great to be able to have both of that because there's a lot of people out there that have a very high level of care and compassion for the people that we serve, both the ones that have passed away and the ones that they leave behind that don't necessarily want to go through the schooling process and things like that. So um, that is a great thing to have here in New Mexico compared to other states. Um, like I said, I've been in the funeral profession for about 16 years. I uh, am a licensed embalmer, so today uh, I will be talking a lot about the embalming aspect of uh, Abraham Lincoln and his influence on, on modern embalming. Uh, if you did get the invites ahead of time and it said that Kobe Hitchcock would be here, well, Kobe Hitchcock is now me. <laughs> he unfortunately had a death in his family and he's back in St. Louis uh, with his family. So I am taking over. He, know, he knew a lot more or knows a lot more about Abraham Lincoln than I do. Than I do. And LaShonda and Justin know a lot more about Abraham Lincoln than I do. So I'm going to do more of the embalming side of things rather than the Abraham Lincoln side of things. But I'll still touch base on that as well. Um, if we want to go ahead and, and do the first slide. So again, this, uh, this presentation is about Abraham Lincoln and modern embalming. We'll kind of go through and see kind of the progression of things, how embalming first started, why, and, and, and everything like that. So modern embalming was used early, uh, early on for anatomical study in Europe. Um, anatomical study was the best way to train doctors. The only bad thing was, was the corpses, the people that passed away, they would go bad. And so they wouldn't be able to do what they needed to do or see what they needed to see to try to figure out how the human body worked and all the little intricacies and, and uh, all the different organs and blood vessels and muscles. So, you know, with the, the decomposition, they were, weren't able to do and train for very long. And they had, it was a very short period of time that they could do with what they, they needed to do. And unfortunately, you know, uh, mo unfortunately, this would lead to a rise in grave robbing, robbing back in that day. Um, so with those that were that um, would donate their bodies to science and the medical doctors would be using. Well, when they weren't weren't able to do it, they, they needed more people. Well, so what they would do is they would have medical students or janitors at the medical school go to the cemeteries and look for fresh graves, the ones that, that somebody had just been buried. Um, and because this was for medical advancement, they would actually leave all of the jewelry, the, the valuables, all of that would still be left behind. That would be left in the grave. They wouldn't take anything like that because that's not what they were after. They were after the, the person themselves so that way doctors could figure out why people died you know, how the body worked, things like that. Um, with this era, what, what kind of came about is a couple of different terms. Um, one, the grave robbers were called resurrectionists, um, and they were also called body snatchers. So what is embalming? Embalming is the injection of a chemical, the most commonly formaldehyde. The formaldehyde acts on the enzymes and bacteria that cause decomposition. Formaldehyde also coagulates proteins and produces firm dry tissue. So what does that mean? So what we do when we do our embalming process, the number one reason for embalming is not for preservation. Everybody thinks it's for preservation. 
It's not. The number one reason for embalming is actually disinfection. Now, a byproduct of disinfection is preservation. Because when we disinfect the body, because everybody has bacteria on them and in them, and that bacteria is what causes decomposition, the breaking down of cells, the breaking down of fluids, things like that inside of our bodies and outside of our bodies. So when we do the embalming process, we are basically disinfecting the body so well that preservation does happen. Now, there are other chemicals inside of you know, the, the embalming chemicals themselves that help with, like it says, coagulate proteins and produces a firm and, and dry tissue. Um, what that does is it, it basically, what we do is we replace as much fluid that's inside, blood, things like that, with this mixture of embalming fluid, water, uh, anticoagulants, different types of chemicals to, to get, uh, the, like I said, the disinfection and preservation taken care of. Um, what is the difference between what they used to do in ancient Egypt with mummification and embalming now? Well, mummification was more of that dry, arid salts and, and um, different, uh, different topical chemicals that would cause more dehydration at a quicker rate, whereas embalming is used for, like I said, disinfection. So that's basically the difference. Now, they would still do things... Um, because most of what they did were topical. They would remove some of the organs, and we've all heard about the canopic jars, or maybe not. Not, okay. <laughs> so the canopic jars were different. There, was, there were jars that different, uh, they had dif different depictions of different Egyptian gods. And what they would do is they would remove the heart, or they would remove the liver, they would remove the kidneys, they would remove all these organs that were inside and place them in the canopic jars for ceremonial purposes. Um, then what they would do is they would use, the, like I said, the different types of, of uh, chemicals. Uh, um, they'd use different uh, deodorants, uh, myrrh and frankincense and things like that. And they would use that on the body topically and then wrap them and place them. Now, the nice thing about Egypt is it's very dry, arid uh, environment. So that helped with the mummification process. With embalming and modern embalming, we're not always in a dry and arid, arid area. Um, when I used to work in you know, East Texas, outside of Houston, I mean, our water table was like six feet. I mean, so our water table was pretty high, so it was always moist there. So, you know, different things we would do would be the embalming process for, uh, you know, for that uh, uh, disinfection. I lost that word, even though I said it 17 times already. Uh, disinfection and preservation process. We would use caskets that had a gasket on it that would help to, we couldn't ever say seal because it doesn't seal anymore. They're gasketed. They lock down rather than latch down. And outer burial containers that could seal. Um, and so we would use that as ways to protect from outside graveside substances um, for there. Uh, whereas back in the ancient Egyptian times, they could just, just about anywhere. I mean, we find tombs of pharaohs that are just in the building. They're not necessarily buried underground or anything like that. They're in a sarcophagus and, or a coffin and just because of that aridness, they still keep that shape. They still keep that appearance. So why do we do it? Why do we do what we do in the funeral profession? The cornerstone of grief and mourning is to acknowledge the reality of death. Viewing the deceased is the most compelling argument for this need. We have a society nowadays that doesn't necessarily live where they grew, where they grew up. Show of hands, who still lives you know, in the same general area of where they were born and grew up? I got four out of 25 people, maybe 20 people. I don't. 
I grew up in Nebraska, moved to Minnesota, moved to Texas, now I'm in New Mexico. Uh, my sisters are, have moved out everywhere as well. We're in a mobile society. We're in a society that when we have loved ones that pass away, we're not necessarily there. And so the ceremony of the funeral has been around for thousands of years. They found, they found graves dating back 10,000 years ago that not only was the, you know, the skeletal structure there, but different knickknacks, different things were placed inside the grave with that person, showing there was a ceremony that was done. So the, one of the hardest things for us over this last year and a half through this pandemic was denying these families that we were serving, that we, I mean, we have taken an ethical oath to help during this grieving time, denying them that closure that morning because we could only have five people. So you had to pick your five closest relatives or for your five favorite relatives to come to a funeral at one point in time. That was the hardest thing for what, that we had to do, you know, during this pandemic. The thing with embalming is, is that it allows time. Time for people to come in from out of state, out of country. It allows time for you to spend with your loved one. It allows you time to start moving forward and start the healing process. Funerals and embalming is not for the person that passed away. They're for the people that are left behind. They're for us. When we go, it's part of our human nature to, to grieve and to mourn. And so by doing the embalming process, doing funeral ceremonies, all of this stuff, that helps us continue uh, our, our lives in a healthy way. A lot of times we think we don't need that. Uh, later on in life, you might realize you did. So that's why we do what we do in, in the, the funeral side of things and in the embalming side of things. So here are a couple of notable people. Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, he died on May 24th, 1861. He was credited as the first death of the Civil War. He was shot after removing a Confederate flag from the roof of the Marshall Hotel in Alexandria, Virginia. Ellsworth was actually the law clerk for Abraham Lincoln when he was in Springfield. Um, Dr. Thomas Holmes, he's known as the father of modern embalming and he was a Civil War embalming surgeon. Holmes developed his own embalming fluid, his own embalming chemicals. Uh, he's also the, the way to administer and to inject the embalming fluid. Um, and he would sell that. He would sell a gallon of embalming fluid for $3. Nowadays, a case of embalming fluid, 24 bottles, a pint each, is about $100, so you wouldn't even get a pint of embalming fluid for, for the amount that, that we paid for a gallon of it back then. Um, Elmsworth was embalmed by Dr. Thomas Holmes at the request of Lincoln. Uh, his funeral was held in the East Room and then sent to, sent to New York. This was Holmes' opportunity to demonstrate how the preservation at that time worked. So back then, they didn't really know exactly what it did. They didn't know that really it was, by the way, of killing the bacteria. They were doing the preservation. They just knew that if I did this, people would, wouldn't decompose as quickly. It would slow down the decomposition process. So when, when he died, when uh, Elmer died, this was Thomas's big shot to try to capitalize on, on something that he figured out, that he pioneered. Thousands died in the first two years of the war and the railroads began to refuse to accept remains for shipment. So they, they would, if they died on the battlefield, they would try to send them home. But the railroads would start to refuse them. They would refuse because of the odor. They would refuse because of infection and the spread of diseases. You know, it, the train didn't go by the battlefield every single day. So those people that died might have been there for a while. And even though they 
ultimately wanted to go back home and their families wanted them to go back home, the railroad would refuse to do it because they didn't want to put their workers at risk or anybody else from the time they you know, picked up to the time they dropped off at risk because of the spread of diseases. We saw this happen very, very rampantly in the, in the 1300s in Europe with the Black Death, the bubonic plague, because people would die of, an, of infectious diseases or uh, because of the plague, even after death, they were spreading that contagion. And so that was one of the, the huge things is that because of the close quarters and everybody, you know, really close in Europe and all of that, that the diseases spread a lot quicker. And so railroads wouldn't want to do that during the Civil War time because they didn't want to continue to spread. So General Order 39, Lincoln understood the importance of sending the dead home to their families intact. He gave Thomas Holmes a commission in the medical corps to, try to train battlefield embalmer embalmers. So because of what he was able to do for one of Lincoln's personal friends, um, Holmes became very rich. He made a lot of money, not only in training other people to do what he did, but also in the chemical sales, the, the pump that he uh, invented to inject the fluid, all of that stuff. So again, like I said, he had that one shot to capitalize and he took advantage of it and he became a very rich person because of it. Here's a couple of pictures of one kind of the, the archaic embalming uh, on your right. You see a tube. So what that is, is that tube is taking the embalming fluid from the pump that he invented, um, or a lot of times they'll use what's called a gravity injector. And what that is, is basically it's a, a, it's a glass container that's up high on a hook, kind of like an IV at a, at a hospital. And we would, they would make an incision. Most of the time it would be right here, uh, right by the collarbone and use the, the, our circulatory system to, to the advantage. That's how we do our embalming, and that kind of shows how we do that. We make that incision, we make a small incision into the, the common carotid artery, and we use the circulatory system to replace the blood in our bodies as much as possible with the mixture of, of embalming fluid. On the left, we see the, the caskets that were made the old coffins that were made. That's another one of those synonymous, uh, but not quite uh, terms, coffin and casket. The difference really between the two is a coffin is more of that anthropoidal shape that you see there. A casket is a more modern, kind of more square, rather, a little bit more roomy. We like to have our bigger vehicles and a little bit more room and in anything that we do, the bigger house. So we want bigger caskets too, you know, we want to be comfortable. They've got the nice velvet linings, the pillows, all that stuff. They just had wood floor on that. <laughs> Trust me, I've seen them. They, they're not comfortable. I'm not speaking from experience. Uh, <laughs> so here is kind of an old mortuary, a barn mortuary. You know, something that was close to a battlefield where they would be able to take, you know, the, the people that died in battle. Um, and it's kind of hard to see those two signs, but the, the one on the left says, Dr. Bunnell, embalming the dead. And then the banner to the right, it says, free from odor and infection, embalming Dr. Bunnell. So back then they realized, even though they weren't sure exactly how it worked, they realized that by doing this embalming process, they were stopping the, the spread of infections. It was a sanitation process. It also helped, like I said, in the, in the preservation. So they, they figured things out like that, even though they might not have known the exact intricacies of it. So um, they advertised it. It doesn't smell in here. <laughs> you're not gonna get the, you know, you're not gonna catch anything. You know, so that, that was the kind of a selling point with embalming back, back in the day. So here are some Civil War facts. 620,000 deaths during the Civil War. Approximately 60,000 of them were embalmed. 
So if they were uh, an enlisted, uh, if they were just enlisted, the embalming charges ranged between $25 and $50. Uh, for an officer, it was $50 to $80. Not sure what the difference is there, besides probably a family could pay more, maybe. <laughs> Capitalism there. Um, <laughs> they also, you know, during the Civil War, was the, you know, the birthplace of the dog tag. Identification. And identification has been huge, you know, since then. I mean, in anything that we do, from the time someone passes away to the time that they are, they are buried or cremated, we have two, three, four different checks of identification the entire way through. Military have been still used the dog tags, you know, that, that was uh, birthed during the Civil War time. Identification is, the, is huge when someone passes away not close to where their family is. And it also started the pre-need funeral plans. Anybody in the room have their pre-need funeral? We got a couple. <laughs> Pre-need funerals, you start paying ahead of time. Because as Gail said, 100% mortality rate. So here is kind of a, a depiction of a, a, a soldier that was prepared for shipment. What they would do is they would do the embalming. They would place them in the caskets and they would position them like this. Now obviously this isn't the same kind of positioning that you would see now at a funeral. Um, as you can see, his eyes are still open. Kudos to that embalmer for how he got the mouth to stay closed, but I have to say that. Um, arm positioning, you know, it's one of those things that with that type of casket, it's a little bit harder to do that, to do that positioning. Um, when I first started uh, dating my ex-wife, she, uh, she would tell people what I did. And this was 13 years ago. And the, one of the first things that they would say was, was he old? No, that's a common misconception. <laughs> Not all funeral directors are, are up in age. And they're like, does he sleep like this? <laughs> it is quite comfortable. Try it tonight when you go to bed. <laughs> so here is William Wallace Lincoln. William died on February 20th, 1862 from typhoid fever. Lincoln called Brown and Alexander embalming surgeons to prepare young Willie. Henry P. Cattell embalmed Willie. The body was entombed in the William Thomas Carroll family vault in Washington, D.C. at that time. And Lincoln visited the vault often and had requested to see him at least three different occasions, which wouldn't have been able to happen if he wasn't embalmed. Or it could have happened, just not with the same results. <laughs> On April 14th, 1865, at 10.15 p.m., Abraham Lincoln was shot while attending the performance of My American Cousin at Ford Theater. He was taken immediately to the Peterson boarding house across the street. Uh, the bullet entered the back of the president's head and stopped right behind his right eye. On April 15th, 1867 at 7.22 a.m., Lincoln died of his injuries. He was wrapped in a flag and taken to the White House. Brown and Alexander embalmers, embalming surgeons were called to perform the embalming, and Henry Cattell performed the procedure on Abraham Lincoln as well. On April 18, 1865, after an autopsy and embalming, Lincoln lay in state prior to the funeral the next day. The casket was constructed of solid walnut. It was lined with lead and covered in black cloth. It was decorated with sterling silver studs and handles. Now, this picture itself, there's a controversy behind it that if that the actual picture is true or not, that it, it hasn't been authenticated. But if it is a reproduction, it's a pretty good fake. I mean, that looks pretty good. You know, it looks like that's how things would be set up. And I mean, to me, to me, I think it's real. On April 21st, 1865, Lincoln's funeral train departed Washington, D.C. The train completed a 1,654-mile, 180-city journey and arrived in Springfield on May 3rd. The train was called Old Nashville. 
and it was the first and only time that Lincoln actually used the presidential car on that train. Willie Lincoln was also on that train with Abraham. Oak Ridge Cemetery, and you'll hear more about that from our next two presenters, but Lincoln's body uh, has been moved 17 times since the original entombment. The last time was in 1901. The casket was opened in 1901, and, he's, and he was said to be absolutely recognized, again, because of embalming. There's been one of the stories that I was told in mortuary school when it comes to, you know, embalming. And again, different factors, you know, play, I mean, different uh, outside conditions play factors in the whole embalming process. But there was a, it was either a Spanish or a Portuguese princess that uh, disobeyed her parents and moved to, to South America. I think all princesses do that. Mine does. So, um, <laughs> not moved to South America, disobeyed the parents. But... It's one of those things that she had died unexpectedly in South America. And by the time that her parents found out that she died and was able to bring her back to Europe, it was about 17 years later. And when they opened the casket and everything there, makeup touch up is all she needed because of the embalming process, because of, you know, the arid climate, you know, all of those factors go into to what we do. Really in conclusion, I mean, thank you for listening. Uh, I, I believe at the end we will have a question and answer. Um, the next, this is the page of the references. Like I said, uh, Kobe Hitchcock was originally doing the presentation, so he's also one of my references. He's not listed there, but he is also one of my references. So thank you very much. Um, and turn it back over to you, Gail. Thank you so much, Josh. That was awesome. Now, with the magic of Zoom, we are going to go to Springfield, Illinois. First, we're going to hear from uh, LaShonda Fitch. She is the executive director of Oak Ridge Cemetery, which is, of course, where Abraham Lincoln is interred. This is the second most visited cemetery in the United States after Arlington National Cemetery. And we'll hear from Justin Blanford, uh, who is the guy who knows all about Lincoln's tomb and much of the history related to what Lincoln did. So LaShonda, are you ready? I am. All right, welcome, so great to see you. Yes, good morning everyone. And a virtual welcome to Oak Ridge Cemetery. Oak Ridge is the largest municipal cemetery in the state of Illinois. It has been owned and operated since 1855 by the city of Springfield. That year, city council purchased the first 15 acres. And the goal was to move all burial grounds out to the outskirts of the city. A year later, an ordinance was passed forbidding any additional burial grounds to be within the half a mile radius of city limits. They also wanted to replace the two graveyards which were located in downtown Springfield. So by the end of that year, Oak Ridge totaled 28 acres. It is believed that before the first burial recorded in 1858, William Saunders was hired by the Oak Ridge Board of Managers, which we still have them today. Saunders was hired to design the landscape of the cemetery, and his design was based off of the popular mid-19th century rural cemetery movement. This design included hilly terrain, plant-like, or I should say natural plantings, and curvy roads. The park-like setting helped grieving families, especially those who lost their children, which was very common during that time. Oak Ridge was dedicated in 1860, and it is told that, or I should say the story is that Abraham and Mary attended that dedication. 
And Abraham had told Mary that he wanted Oak Ridge to be his final resting place. Oak Ridge is the final resting place of over 77,000 individuals. People from all over the world is buried here. And it's estimated that we have over 200 years of burial space remaining. Oak Ridge is home to the Sangamon County's first indoor mausoleum, the Abbey. It also is home to the Illinois State War Memorials, the World War II, Vietnam and Korean War, War Memorials. As Gail said, we are in the top most visited cemeteries in the nation. When people come, we ask that or we encourage that you stop by Lincoln's tomb, of course, and rub the nose of Lincoln's bust that is outside the tomb. I rubbed it several years ago and I am now the 20th director of this beautiful one of a kind cemetery. Oak Ridge is now 365 acres. And of that 14 and a half is managed and maintained by the state historic sites of Springfield, which Justin Blanford is the superintendent. And he's gonna tell you more about the tomb and Lincoln legacy. Thank you. Hello and welcome uh, from uh, the virtual world of uh, the Lincoln Tomb. It's my pleasure to uh, join uh, this amazing group of, of individuals. I've learned a lot today already and I'm sure everyone's in, enjoying it immensely. Um, the first slide in our, our presentation shows um, uh, the Lincoln Tomb contact information. And so I, I just want to, again, introduce um, myself. I work for the Illinois Department of uh, Natural Resources in the state of Illinois. Very proud to be LaShonda's partner uh, in Oak Ridge Cemetery, not only for the, the Lincoln Tomb, but also for the war memorials that she mentioned. So we have the, um, the real blessing to be the stewards for um, many, many individuals and uh, the caretakers uh, of the legacies of these monuments. There's been a lot of discussion in our country uh, over the last several years and for quite a long time, really, uh, about monuments. And I'd like to spend most of the time today um, talking about how the Lincoln Tomb fits into that larger discussion. But first, a little bit more background. So we'll move to the second slide that shows how the Lincoln Tomb fits into our network of historic sites. The tomb is just one of uh, the sites that we're responsible for in the capital city. There are six actual locations uh, and more than 22 acres of space that, that we care for uh, in uh, Springfield, the capital of Illinois. Obviously, we'll get back to the tomb in a minute, but um, paired with the Lincoln tomb and our responsibility is the building where Lincoln uh, worked in the legislature uh, it's in the upper left-hand corner, the Old State Capitol. Interestingly, the Old State Capitol has ties to uh, the story we're talking about today because it was the location of the final funeral uh, from May 3rd to May 4th of 1865. Lincoln's body lay in rest in the State House while a crowd estimated at more than 70,000 individuals passed through the space um, to pay their respects to the fallen president. In the middle of the upper row is um, a, a small commercial building. That's the only remaining building where space is still uh, accessible that Lincoln had an office in. Uh, it's literally down to the last square footage uh, that Lincoln would have worked in outside of a government building. He rented space from a merchant named Seth M. Tinsley in this commercial building from roughly uh, 1841 to 1852. Then on the upper right-hand corner is a uh, small um, Greek Revival House, we call it today the Vachel Lindsay home. Vachel Lindsay actually wrote a very well-known poem in the early 20th century to learn more about sort of the artistic interpretation of Lincoln's legacy. I want to encourage you to uh, check that out, and I think you'll enjoy learning about that. In Lincoln's time, that little house uh, was the location where one of Mary's um, sisters lived. So Lincoln would have actually visited the house that we now call the Vachel Lindsay Homestead Historic Site. Uh, 
today. Then dropping down, uh, Lincoln's uh, legacy also had an impact on uh, you know many other individuals in many different types of fields. And one individual that uh, was inspired by Abraham Lincoln in the late 19th century was an architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. And so our, our, in the lower left-hand corner is uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Dana Thomas House that was built between 1902 and 1904. Uh, that, so that might seem disconnected, um, but Lincoln's impact stretches and also, you know, the in interest in interpreting democracy through architecture was very important to Frank Lloyd Wright. And we see that play out in the Prairie School architecture that is evident in the, the Dana Thomas House. In the middle, you see uh, an image of one of our memorials. That is the image of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that we both discussed. And finally, then in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a blue sky image of the Lincoln tomb. So we'll move to the next slide and just speak a little bit about the vision for the Lincoln tomb, which was conceived by an architect named Larkin Mead. And Mead had served as an illustrator uh, during the Civil War and had uh, other monument related experience. But he is one of numerous individuals who responded to a call for proposals from an organization known as the Lincoln Monument Association. One of Lincoln's closest friends, Governor Richard Oglesby, gathered together with a, a small group of other friends and associates that wished to uh, help uh, create the monument that would carry Lincoln's legacy forward physically on the landscape uh, in the days after the assassination and, and private monies had to be raised. So this essentially a nonprofit organization was um, created. And what you're seeing there is an artist's rendering of, um, and it, you know, by all accounts, we believe that would have been Larkin Mead's drawing himself uh, of what the tomb was uh, supposed to look like uh, in a, as a design concept. And this is a, um, a, an image of one of the certificates that would have been used uh, to thank someone and acknowledge someone who would have donated to the cause of the Lincoln Monument Association paying for this very large monument at the time. So when someone made a donation, they would have been re essentially received this very, very beautiful receipt, uh, if you will, as both a gift and an acknowledgement of the donation. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the, the vision for this um, monument to Lincoln was something that Larkin Mead hatched actually prior to the assassination. He and was thinking of something like this uh, before the assassination as a way to honor Lincoln. And it was something I think on individuals' minds, uh, it, those living in the East and certainly in the Washington area would have been very familiar with a similar design uh, that was taking shape, one that you know, Lincoln actually contributed uh, financially to in the Washington uh, Monument. And so uh, Meade motivated perhaps by that, uh, definitely by his um, uh, dedication and commitment and support for Abraham Lincoln, uh, had this design somewhat in his mind and, and ready and, and all it needed to do was to be refined and then directed toward uh, the call for proposals that had been issued. Um, what I think is, is also interesting uh, ab about this whole process, we could do a whole segment on the, uh, the, the artist's interpretation uh, for, for the call for proposals, but Meade was not alone in his interest for the Emancipation Proclamation. Numerous artists uplifted the notion of the Emancipation Proclamation in their response to the call for proposals, and we'll revisit that. Um, that notion in just a few minutes. So obviously this grand vision could not be implemented immediately. It would take time um, to uh, raise the funds. It would take then even more time to construct. But in the near term, we'll move to the next slide and take a look at the receiving vault that was initially used to receive the body of Abraham Lincoln and also to receive the body of his son, Willie, whose body you know, came back with him on the ride, uh, the train from, from Washington, DC. This was a uh, receiving vault that had already existed prior to the assassination. So this would have been in use 
in Oak Ridge Cemetery, um, the, the very significant of uh, the, the burial uh, of Abraham Lincoln in Oak Ridge Cemetery. Now, we are told that following um, the movement in that year in 1865, that this receiving vault for quite a while did continue to be used. Uh, and it wasn't really until the early 20th century when its uh, connection to the tomb um, became uh, heightened in, in the awareness of, of individuals and then uh, fully connected, you know, really in the story of uh, the burial and the construction of the Lincoln tomb. And then at that point, early in the 20th century, I've been told in, you know, around the 1920s, at that point, then no more um, individuals uh, lay in rest in the receiving vault. That's at the bottom of the hill. What at that time uh, would have been at the front of the Lincoln tomb, but now it's considered the, the back hill because the entrance to Oak Ridge um, Cemetery has changed. Um, over time. So Lincoln's body and his son's body rest in the temper, uh, sorry, in the receiving vault uh, until December of 1865. And then we'll move to the next slide. So you can see all the temporary vault and their bodies rest there uh, from 1866 until the tomb as we know it today is substantially finished in 1870 and um, into that period. And the temporary vault no longer exists in, um, in, in Oak Ridge Cemetery. That was completely deconstructed. We do mark the location of it with a large stone, which again, um, you know, logistically you would get to it by going behind the tomb and begin to move um, down the hill toward the, the receiving vault. Um, so it is a place we we recognize spatially, uh, but it is it is it does not exist as a place that individuals can can come and, and reconnect with. Although there's great interest in it, um, I, I think that um, I, I've been asked just as an aside, you know, why do we think that was the case? And again, remember the receiving vault continued to be utilized, so it makes sense. There's still a need for the initial receiving vault beyond the construction of the tomb. But it seems from the uh, very beginning, the temporary tomb is considered temporary, even in the way it's, it's referred to. And, and I think they wanted to avoid any confusion. Um, so that, that's my explanation of why it was, it was completely removed. And then now we'll move to a historic image of, of the Lincoln tomb. And this is um, an early image that uh, illustrates Initially, that the obelisk was much smaller. Um, now, there are periods of uh, reconstruction of the tomb, uh, first in, in 1899 and then later on in, in the 1930s. And then in the 1890s, though, the obelisk is, is actually increased in size. So that's the major change that happens. The uh, work wasn't undertaken for that purpose. It was undertaken actually because it was determined that the tomb um, was not stable. And so uh, the, the tomb was removed um, piece by piece, taken down piece by piece. Bodies were removed to temporary locations. At that time, uh, a stronger foundation was put in place. And at that time, um, the uh, height of the obelisk was, was raised to 114 feet. So um, I, I want to reach the next slide. And we're going to kind of move into a uh, a discussion briefly that I feel is very, very important for uh, not only the Lincoln tomb, but the larger discussion of monuments in general. And um, also I, I think uh, the, the notion of national unity and, and how monuments can be uh, helpful to us. Um, I, I firmly believe, believe that uh, all monuments deserve a discussion and we need to find ways to create those discussion topics. So with this particular monument in place, we have a number of symbols that we can see um, that allow us to, you know, get a chance to understand the message that was being sent forth. So I think we're going to pause right here if we can. And we have a video that kind of gives you the overview of the Lincoln tomb. And then we'll resume this discussion 
when the video's finished. The Lincoln tomb is the final resting place of Abraham Lincoln, his wife Mary, and three of their four sons. In Springfield, Illinois, it stands as a monument not only to Abraham Lincoln, but also to the soldiers who fought under Lincoln during the Civil War. Lincoln's initial burial place in Oak Ridge Cemetery was at the bottom of the hill on which the monument is built. Lincoln's body was placed in a receiving vault on May 4th of 1865 and remained at the, in the vault throughout the rest of that year. In 1866, Lincoln's body was transferred to a temporary vault halfway up the hill, where it remained until 1870 when it could be transferred to the final Lincoln Monument and Tomb. The Monument and Tomb feature many important architectural symbols on the exterior. The obelisk, an ancient Egyptian symbol for leadership. A larger-than-life statue of Abraham Lincoln at its base, outstretched in his hand is a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. The document, effective January 1st of 1863, allowed for the enlistment of African-American soldiers in the Union Army. The monument also includes four bronze statues acknowledging the service of soldiers during the Civil War. Infantry, artillery, cavalry, and navy are represented on the corners. At the final base of the upper deck is a chain of unbroken links that lists the initials of each state in the Union. The interior of the monument features several bronze statues of Abraham Lincoln that allow guests to reflect on Lincoln in different stages and roles of his professional life. The hallways conclude at the burial chamber, which is the final resting place for Abraham Lincoln, Mary, and three of their four sons. <laughs> a bust of Lincoln created by the artist Gustav Borglum is on the plaza outside of the Lincoln tomb. It's said that rubbing the nose of the bust of Lincoln brings those who visit the site good luck. So we're going to return to the slide where we see that larger than life statue. It's the one that's right behind me as well uh, in, my, in my backdrop. But what I mean by a dialogue with, with monuments is that the, you know, these symbols cannot interpret themselves. And I would venture to say, uh, it's probably safe to say that many of you, um, while you heard my you know, response or, or my articulation about the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, and its importance in allowing for the recruitment and enlistment of, of black troops during the Civil War, that's probably not the first thing that jumped to your mind in terms of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, in general, uh, our education system and our, our societal system, uh, we've been taught you know, that the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was a document that freed the slaves. You know, that's, the, that's the common response that we hear when we begin talking about it. And, it can be very confusing, and, and we often find people confused yet today, uh, even historians and enthusiasts about uh, Lincoln's ability. That, that could really still be debated by historians and constitutional scholars today of whether or not you know, he had the ability, uh, since the states were in rebellion, to issue such um, a, a portion uh, of it that dealt with their rights um, as, as slave owners in the South. And the notion of African American soldiers, um, you know, being empowered to join the ranks, and, and they did to the tune of more than two hundred and twenty thousand in number, uh, beginning in in, uh, in 1863. Well, that note has been, in many ways, I think, uh, purposefully sidelined, you know, in our education system and in in the general history books. So. We really feel a responsibility at the tomb when we began to uncover that the gap in history that, you know, the intent, the vision is that the Emancipation Proclamation be uplifted. And I'm quite certain that those living in 1870, uh, and, and certainly Larkin Mead himself and the other artists who recommended, I feel confident that they were aware of that importance um, role. Uh, of the Emancipation Proclamation related to black soldiers at that time. And I think it's after that period, during Reconstruction, during the struggle for civil rights in the 20th century, where that notion has been forgotten. So we work very hard to have a dialogue about this monument in that way. The monument was designed to allow people to get closer to the symbols but unfortunately due to the liabilities that go along with low rails and, and, and different uh, things, 
it, that's not now part of the experience. And so there's been a, a challenge or an obstacle introduced, if you will, that also makes it harder for people to connect to those symbols. So we have to do a better job of creating a meaningful dialogue on the outside of the tomb and preparing individuals to, to hear the message that was intended for us. And we, we feel that that's a very, very healthy process. And it reminds us all that it's not a select number of cities that, you know, that are, you know, should be having these discussion about monuments. It's all of us. And it also, I think, uplifts the importance of uh, cemeteries and helping us understand our history. After we began having this dialogue in our, uh, among our team and, and, and in our agency and begin going in a new direction, uh, I would have to say that's one of the things that inspired us to partner more with Lashonda. And just this past year, uh, we began introducing what we call Walk, Hike, Bike History which uh, enables our storytellers to move up into the hills of Oak Ridge Cemetery, leading individuals on essentially stories that discuss in depth the, the friends of Abraham Lincoln who were buried in Oak Ridge Cemetery, black history in Oak Ridge Cemetery. And that has been a very, very rewarding process. And we look forward to continuing uh, that relationship with Oak Ridge Cemetery in the near future. As we move to wrap up, I, I felt obligated to give you one more <laughs> visit inside uh, the Lincoln tomb where you can actually see the burial chamber and, and have, have a moment to, to connect with it. This is, um, in a sense, a, a, a modern notion in that early on, other than the caretaker or the superintendent, someone in my role, individuals could not go inside of the Lincoln Monument and Tomb. They could go up the stairs and even, um, a quite a risky notion really, go up the obelisk uh, to a lookout that's at the top of the obelisk, but they couldn't go inside. And so Lincoln's body and his son's bodies were inside um, the monument, but the public did not go in there. You might see behind the stone, uh, the large granite stone, that there's a, a window. And so individuals would come to that window and look into the burial chamber, but, but not go in. And so over time, what's interesting about the way that we want to connect uh, with those who have died is uh, Lincoln's body has then been buried. And that was an act carried out by Robert shortly after the turn of the century in order uh, to, I think, ensure that his father could rest in peace. But also then in the 1930s, a project was undertaken to finish out the hallways of the inside of the monument. So that enabled then individuals to come in and see the finished spaces, see the rotunda. Uh, and then those spaces were then outfitted with additional bronze statues, those that you saw in the video that we prayed, played a few moments ago. So I, I think it's, it's fascinating as we look at the changes over time uh, that we can take in by, by studying the Lincoln tomb. While it started out as a monument that kept people on the outside, but at that time they had a greater ability to access the symbols. Now we have to augment the restricted access to the symbols through storytelling and history education but now we can bring people inside the monument and they actually get to go to the burial chamber. And again, that's been possible since the 1930s. And then we'll finish uh, perhaps as we should with a blue sky uh, image of the tomb. I'll note finally, one of the um, more recent initiatives that we've been working on for the, the past couple of years deals with the landscape. Uh, the landscape is obviously closely tied to the monument and the impression that individuals leave following the experience is the result of both. And uh, we have had the benefit of resources that have enabled us to undertake several uh, beautification and accessibility projects uh, over the last several years. So those rose bushes <laughs> and boxwoods that you see uh, in the foreground of the tomb, those are, are fairly uh, new additions. And right now, right this very week, we are rebuilding the stairway that leads from the back of the tomb down the hill to the receiving vault. And uh, that's no small project at all. It's roughly a half a million dollar uh, staircase that's, that's uh, being installed in partnership with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and also our partners 
through a parks roads program at the Illinois Department of Transportation. So again, it's my sincere uh, pleasure to be a part of the program today. I'm looking forward to the uh, question and answer session. And of course, um, more than anything, I want this to serve as an invitation uh, to all of you. Come and visit Lashonda and me and in Oak Ridge Cemetery. Uh, we invite you to enjoy it in person uh, when you feel comfortable uh, traveling and visiting the space. But we are open uh, for four guests seven days a week from 9 until 4.45 p.m. Thank you again for your time. It's been my honor to, to be a part of the program. Thank you, Justin. That was great. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention, he talked about the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and that African Americans could become Union soldiers. Well, here in Albuquerque, in historic Fairview Cemetery, where we are going to have our closing event, we have 16 Buffalo soldiers buried there. And uh, on Veterans Day, we'll be uh, actually telling some of the history of those Buffalo soldiers. There have been uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution have done research about uh, some of those soldiers who are buried there. And so we have a connection between Albuquerque, New Mexico and Springfield, Illinois. <laughs> Any questions you'd like to pose? I know I've got a question. So, our, so you had, um, uh, LaShonda, how many people did you say are buried there? Over 77,000 are interred as of today. That's a lot of people as of today and they and they keep adding up <laughs> yes but you said you've got how much more burial space there it is estimated over 200 years remaining that's a lot <laughs> yes we we are a very big place here lots <laughs> of space well, Fairview is only 17 and a half acres, but, uh, and we're not burying anybody there anymore. <laughs> yes, why, question. Why isn't Lincoln's other son, they said three of his four sons why, are buried with him? Why isn't, why wasn't the other son? Buried? Did you all hear that question? Why is, why aren't all four of Lincoln's sons buried there? Three, you said three of four? Maybe that's a question for Justin. Sure, sure. I'd be glad to answer that question or at least provide my interpretation um, of the answer <laughs> to that question. I think it's really um, interesting that, um, that Robert chose not to. And I've tried to think a, a little bit about this and it's hard for us, I think, to put ourselves in his shoes. Um, one of the things that helped what I think is a good understanding of the situation is that Robert lived a very long life. So he was born in, in 1843 and he lived until 1926. And his last real interactions with the tomb would be working to ensure that his father was buried shortly after the turn of the century. So there's a couple decades really uh, where his life continues and his interaction with the tomb becomes more distant. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to think of it from not only his perspective, but the perspective of his family. And one of the phrases I think that gave me some comfort or assurance is something that I don't hear a lot of younger generations use that I heard from my great grandparents and grandparents when I was young. And that's the phrase, rest in peace. And it seems to me that it makes sense that Robert may have simply been wishing his father to rest in peace as well as his mother and three of his four brothers. And I think returning to the tomb in some substantial way, whether that be where, where he would choose to be in turn, may have interrupted that, that, that proverb, if you will, or that, that 
that guidance that would have been very, very much more important in Victorian America, based on the, you know, the, the socially accepted behaviors. And again, as I think many of you would agree, it's outside of our circles. It's largely a forgotten, it's, it's a forgotten idea. The other piece that I think um, we need to remember is that there were loved ones uh, surrounding Robert uh, who were part of his family now that didn't have those connections to Springfield anymore. So while his connections ran deep, his life grew well beyond Springfield uh, into other states where he spent most of his adult life. And I think for them, which are individuals, again, that uh, you know, many of us and many of you more than me even, are continually interacting with individuals in a similar kind of situation whose vision and goals and ideals impact the decisions they make um, when they're planning a funeral, when they're planning where individuals are going to be buried. So I say all of this um, because I, I've heard really too often that Robert's burial in Arlington, which he earned as a captain already in, in uh, the Civil War and then would have uh, continued to build upon that with his work as the Secretary of War under two presidents. But I've heard it too often associated with distance that may have existed between Robert and his mother and often used as an illustration. And I, and I have to say, I find that distasteful. I, I think that, uh, you know, individuals who want to try to psychoanalyze or, you know, uh, get into uh, an understanding of the relationship or a disconnect uh, that Robert had with his mother often use that. And, and I, uh, I, don't, I don't really uh, find that appealing. So anyway, I, I don't know that anyone really knows for sure um, because the people who made those decisions are, are gone. But um, I hope some of you might find some of the thoughts I shared about that uh, reasonable. Well, and that, thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, this is more about embalming itself, but. Uh, embalming question. <laughs> uh, well, with bodies being able to be preserved through like refrigeration and cold storage nowadays, how often is embalming really necessary? Well, again, with, you know, even with refrigeration and cold storage, um, the infectious portion of it, the embalming is really mostly done, you know, for when we have uh, public gathering, public viewings, things like that, because that, that helps out with the, um, the disinfection portion uh, of, of everything. So there's not any uh, communicable diseases or anything like that that, um, that are passed on. So with embalming, uh, most funeral homes require the embalming to actually take place if we have any type of public viewing. Um, it doesn't necessarily take place for family private viewings, you know, immediate family only. Uh, if, you know, cremation is going to take place afterwards or immediate burial is going to take place afterwards. Um, for the most part throughout the country, uh, embalming is required when we have public viewings. So it, it still happens quite often. Yeah. yeah, who gets to be buried in Oak Ridge Cemetery? <laughs> it, I, I'm reminded of um, a slogan that historic congressional cemetery in Washington, D.C. had, which is, you don't have to be a congressman, you just have to be dead. <laughs> 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 so LaShonda, how does that work? So everyone can be buried in Oak Ridge Cemetery. We don't, although historic uh, Oak Ridge, there were spaces that were defined. So like we do have a Islamic section, we have a Jewish section. Um, and so back in the day is when it was, everyone could be buried in the cemetery. However, certain spaces were assigned. Now, as I stated in my presentation, or I should say earlier, we have people from all around the country and the world who was buried here at the cemetery. I'll repeat the question. So if you're in New Mexico, but you wanna be buried in your cemetery, could she arrange that? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> we actually just had someone from Texas who was here visiting the tomb and was just so in awe of the grounds they came into the office and purchased their burial space. 
No need. Do you have any green burial plots there? At this time, we do not, but I am looking to have some innovation. Um, I'm also looking to, again, I do have a board of managers that assist with the advisory of the cemetery. Um, but we're, we're thinking of spaces, especially cremation, a scattering garden is something that may be, or I should say a scattering trail, uh, may be something in our, our near future. But definitely keep check us out on Facebook and or our website as we update that frequently when we do have changes. Okay, to repeat uh, the question, she asked about the states that are represented on the, on the tomb that are interlinked. And are they set at a particular period in time? Or did you add states as um, the states were added? Yes, uh, states were added, um, you know, later on. So all states are, are represented. But the initial uh, design also at that time accounted for all states. So the message of that linkage for all of the states underneath the four different battle groups uh, is another very important symbol. And you, you can take it in as the, the, the foundation, really. The unity of the states is the strength of the military under the guidance of the commander in chief. So the Confederate states were also included? That's correct. Ah, because the union was preserved. Union was preserved. Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so speaking of resting in peace, um, why Lincoln was moved 17 times. <laughs> uh, what influenced that decision? Ah, a grave decision. Uh, okay, so Lincoln was moved 17 times. She's asking about resting in peace. That's not exactly resting, but um, so. Yeah, you know, it's, so a, often? it's one of those things that, you know, I think has been accentuated for dramatic interpretation, you know, just like the notion that, well, Robert's not there, you know, that kind of thing. And in some cases, again, is the case that if that Robert's not there, you know, there's a, there's a reasonable explanation, I think, if we, we look into it. So some of that movement is the notion that the receiving vault is the initial location, and then a temporary vault is constructed. And then there's movement into the Lincoln Monument itself. And as I mentioned, there were a number of hallways in that space. And there are two, you know, significant periods of, of, you know, reconstruction, if you will. And for one of those, his body was above ground. And so a temporary, uh, you know, resting place had to be identified again nearby during that, that reconstruction phase. There is simply in the, the, the makeup or the construction of the tomb, this network of hallways. And I, I don't think we, you know, fully realized that his body was even being moved you know but it's not it's not moved beyond the monument itself um other than during that you know that construction period when a, a new foundation had to be uh, reached by by digging by digging deeper down into to bedrock and I, I honestly, I think the, the other part of that is just in the, the, the caretakers who had the access um, did that. And, and then you're, you're trying to I get, get inside the mind of uh, you know, specific individuals who were responsible at that time. There is an attempt in 1876 to steal Lincoln's body. You know, that is not successful, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, that that might have played a role in uh, some of the train of thought. Now, whether that was justified or not, that's another, that's another matter. Um, but I, I don't know the extent that that might have played a role into the caretaker's decision to move him from one location to another inside the tomb for a period of time. I, I, I don't know. Um, my point would be, though, I wouldn't make more of it than it is because as you've heard you know at least a handful of those decisions were simply out of necessity due to the you know uh, construction that's going on 
or the rehabilitation that was necessary in order to ensure the, the long-term uh, safety and stability of the monument itself. What I'd like to know is, is there a separate uh, location for those that are cremated versus for full body burial? I mean, when you buy your plot ahead of time, do you have to have already made that decision, uh, which you may change later? So if you, the question is about cremation placement versus a full body burial placement. And can you change your mind? So um, I guess, Josh, you could actually talk about this with the cemeteries here, but LaShonda also, you know, if you want to weigh in. And I would just like to comment about, since we're talking about monuments and final resting places, and so many people this day and age are saying, oh, just cremate me and scatter me anywhere. But I think there's a, a role for remembrance that these final resting places are, are play an important part for those of us who are still alive and want to remember those people. So Lashonda, you want to start first? Absolutely. So we do have designated areas for cremation only. But our grave spaces are up to three burial rites, which mean that you can have one traditional casketed body and two cremations on top of that body, or you can go extra deep and you can have two traditional casketed bodies and a cremation. So yes, you can change your mind if you purchase a regular burial space. Yeah. <laughs> the long and short of it is yes. <laughs> it, well, it, and that's the thing. I mean, if you choose, it, it depends. Like LaShonda was saying, there are certain spaces that are designated specifically for cremation. And the size of those spaces are much, much smaller, you know, 24 by 24, 30 by 30 um, spaces for cremation burial itself. The other spaces that would accommodate a full-size casket can always be converted to cremation burial spaces, um, but you can't convert a cremation space into it because we don't go up and down. <laughs> but I will add, here at Oak Ridge, you can't upgrade. So if you do purchase initially a cremation space, we can look to uh, accommodate. As I stated, we have plenty of burial space available. Spoken like a true cemeterian. Yes. <laughs> well, and there are different options as well. I mean, you could be in the ground in a burial plot. You could have a niche in a wall. Um, you could have your own little mausoleum. Yeah. <laughs> you could have your own tomb like Lincoln. Much smaller, probably. <laughs> yeah. One, one more? Question. Yeah. On, you said three rights in the tournament. I've always heard two rights. Uh, so the number of interment rights per burial plot was the question. Um, three, two, is it, uh, how is it determined? By the cemetery, by the state? That was the question. Uh, that is something that is determined by the cemetery. That's what And so we have the one burial interment that comes with the grave space and then you would purchase the additional up to three here at Oak Ridge. Yeah, and, that, and that's completely dependent on the cemetery. Like, like I said, um, back in the Houston area with the water table being so high, very rarely do you even have double depth, two rights of, of interment in one space. You know, out here we do. Uh, in all of our cemeteries, we have double depth. Uh, it also depends on the actual kind of ground that you're burying in, in and of itself. Um, you know, you go far enough down here, it's too hard to even get through. But probably, as I would say, you know, up in Oak Ridge, the ground three spaces down is, is a lot softer than what the ground three spaces down here in New Mexico is. So that, that all is dependent. So it's not a state regulation. It's a, a cemetery, cemetery region whatever else, you know, it, it, but it's basically left up to each individual cemetery like LaShonda said. Awesome, I think we got time for one more question, if anybody, yes? Question for Josh. Um, regarding 
So the question is about disinfecting with a green burial. Okay. If you don't, since, you don't since you're not embalming. Right. So typically, so when, when we did a lot of, I did a lot of green burials in Houston. Uh, we actually had a section in our cemetery that was for green burial uh, only. Um, typically, we would wrap in a shroud and place in the ground. Uh, there would only be um, a private family viewing, not really uh, a full-on um, public viewing or anything like that. But we do, they do make green chemicals, you know, chemicals, but they're not. You know, like you can buy at the store, you can buy disinfectants that are, that are green, that are, um, you know, safe to use, environmentally safe, things like that. They do make green chemicals that we can do topical disinfection. We just don't do inside. We, we don't do anything intrusive when it comes to you know, the embalming process itself, it's more of a topical disinfection rather than a full-on embalming process. And then wrapped in a shroud and placed into, into the ground uh, for green burial purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you didn't know, there is a green burial ground here in New Mexico near Belen, which that's all they do. Um, shroud burial, uh, biodegradable caskets, and no vault or liner, and actually even no marker. They, they mark it by um, GPS positioning coordinates, yeah. What's the name of that cemetery? That's La Puerta Natural Burial Ground, yeah. Well, awesome, would you guys like to make a final statement? I just sure. want to say thank you so much, Gail. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, everyone in the room, again, thank you so much for having us and coming to Springfield virtually. Uh, I look forward to watching and learning more about the Before I Die Festival. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, LaShonda. And thank you, Justin. Great information. Thank you so much, Gail. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, a delight to uh, a delight to join everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to help us uh, share uh, with the audience some of the the lessons that we've learned uh, about monuments and about their role uh, in society today, and uh, uh, the commitment that we really need to have, and how important uh, of a role cemeteries can play in, in continuing to be a place of comfort, not only for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, but for a nation, uh, we feel, uh, that needs to find itself. Cemeteries play a very, very important role. And so uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about what we're experiencing in that regard. And have a great conference the rest of your time. Thank you. And And I would echo that idea that um, it is important to have something that marks that we were here. Um, I'm the president of Historic Fairview Cemetery, which is a nonprofit organization that is charged with sharing the history and maintaining this uh, high desert cemetery. And it's interesting. In New Mexico, when you say green burial, it's actually brown burial, because let's face it, we are in a high desert climate. So this is wrapping up this session for the Before I Die Festival. Next up, we are going to have a death cafe and lunch will be served, yay. Uh, later this afternoon, Althea Halchuk's going to be talking about advanced medical directives and making sure that what you want medically towards end of life is actually honored. And then we'll uh, have a hands-on workshop on how to build an altar to honor our loved ones, which is very important right now as we're getting ready for Halloween and Day of the Dead. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and then we'll also have a breakout session virtually while you guys here in the room are doing hands-on work, we'll be online talking about grief issues. So you can catch up with that later if you're staying here and doing the hands-on with the altar building. So thank you and uh, thank you to Gathering Us for helping us coordinate between here in real life in this room and out there on Zoom.